Welcome to Lecture 6, Part 3 on Management Practices. We're looking specifically at grazing in this part of the lecture. This is a topic of agronomy which is taught as part of the agricultural degree offered at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Please visit our website at www.nmit.edu.au for further details on this subject and other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. This lecture has been broken up into a number of parts. In the first part we were introduced to plant management. In the second part we concentrated on the management of cropping. In part three, this lecture, we will be concentrating on grazing. And in part four, we will be concentrating on fodder conversion. Please ensure that you watch all of these lectures to complete your notes on these areas. Grazing is not a difficult concept to explain. It simply describes a type of livestock feeding where the livestock feeds on the plants. Grazing can be thought of as the conversion of grass into meat, milk or other products such as leather. There are several objectives when managing grass for grazing. You hope to optimise your pasture growth and quality. You hope to use the pasture efficiently and profitably. You hope to ensure pasture quality is suitable for stock. You want to reduce worm burdens, persistence of desirable species, ensure ground cover to prevent erosion and weed invasion, and maximise water infiltration and soil water storage. The livestock have an influence on the grazing. This is known as selective grazing. Both sheep and cattle can select better quality feed. Sheep graze closer to the ground and are more sensitive. They therefore affect composition more. Undesirable species will capture more light and become dominant. A mixed sward under continuous lays grazing will rapidly change composition. Animal influence grazing paddocks by applying pressure. They can significantly improve composition. Undergrazed pastures recycle nutrients slowly. Don't till well and clovers don't germinate well. Low fertility is low grazing pressure weeds, bent and fog for example, will dominate undergrazed pastures. Perennial rye glass to tolerates grazing better than weeds. When you are grazing for production, you need to consider the number of cows and the area that you are going to graze these cows over. This is referred to as grazing for production per head or grazing for production per hectare. It is well known that stocking rate is one of the most significant determinants of pasture productivity and profitability, and this should be considered in your management. According to Dr. Rod Manning, a researcher in this area, if pregnancy rates in cows are above 95%, you are not pushing the cows hard enough, and if less than 87%, you are pushing the system too hard. This assumes no health or other nutritional disorders within your stock. As like so many things, this is a compromise. Aim to match feeding requirements with pasture requirements. Match your animals with the lowest demand with the poorest pastures. Use benchmarkers to achieve this. Pastures may need to spell or replenish carbohydrates, so allow this in your rotations. The table on your screen shows the carrying capacity. This is the relationship of the time of year with your paddock size and how much awesome P should be applied. You will notice there are different quantities if your paddock is over 20 hectares compared to under 20 hectares. Also, this is dependent on what point in the growing season you are currently at. Reg French and Jeff Schultz developed a water use efficiency concept in South Australia. They thought about crop performance in terms of quality of grain produced per millimetre of rainfall which falls over the growing season, which is usually in South Australia between April to October. 
they made an assumption that the crops that they would investigate would be well managed and therefore it would be close to the potential of the crop. You can use this data to mark your own crop. You know the water, the, the average rainfall that you should be getting and you can see if your crop potential is close to an actual potential. This is a very useful format to compare. We call this benchmarking. As mentioned in one of the first lectures on climate and agronomy, rainfall is an absolutely essential component to the successful growing of cereal crops in Australia. The following graph shows the relationship between potential yield in tonnes per hectare and the growing season rainfall. As you can see, there is quite a linear relationship between rainfall and yield potential. Therefore, the more rain, the more optimally your crop can perform. In the graph, we have these relationships for barley, wheat, grain, legumes, chickpeas and canola. And the optimal cropping load ranges from 10 kilogr kilograms per millimetre to 18 kilograms per millimetre of rain. In farming, profit is the key determinant of success and in a pasture-based system of animal production, such as we have in Australia, profitability is closely linked to the utilisation of pasture as this is the cheapest source of feed. So across both Australia and New Zealand, pasture production tends to vary between 3 and 10 concentrates per dry matter of paddock. However, if the pasture is not managed properly, an increasing amount is wasted and the productive life of the pasture is reduced. In this situation, the pasture can become a more expensive source of feed. Concentrates that are small areas across the paddock can vary in their dry matter production from 12 to 40 concentrates per kilogram. To give an example of rye grass production in South Australia, the, mans the maximum production from perennial rye grass white clover mix was 18 to 20 tonnes per hectare per year under ideal environmental conditions and ideal management. The maximum utilisation is between 80 to 90 percent of this potential production. The maximal persistence is about five to 10 years or more at this level of production. These are ideally what you should be aiming for in this kind of pasture, in this kind of area. It is always worth trying to research what your area and your pasture type should ideally be cropping at. Therefore, you can make decisions as to whether you need to improve the efficiencies of your system or if you are doing a very good job at your current efficiencies. Many dry land dairy pastures are not performing at optimal and they tend to produce between 5 and 12 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year. This may be improved by 25% or more if irrigation is available. Their average utilisation is estimated to be around 50 to 60% of the potential. This is telling us that farmers face many challenges when they're managing their pastures and their supplements. The aim of good pasture management is to grow a large amount of high quality pasture, the majority of which can be either eaten or consumed and which will persist for the maximum possible time. Productivity, quality, utilisation and persistence are linked and recent research has provided that similar management can utilise all four practices. This management is underpinned by a great understanding of how pasture plants grow and what they require in order to perform, uh, uh, to perform at their best. Therefore, we are going to spend the next few slides looking at pasture growth before we look at specific management strategies. In its simplest form, grass is the population of tillers. Tillers are the functional units of branch grasses such as ryegrass, fescue, foxfoot, ferris and paspalium. Each tiller, also known as a, a moderated stem, has its own leaves and roots, but is connected to each other at the base of the plant and so can share its water, nutrients and carbohydrates.
tillers, and therefore the root system of a plant, have a lifespan of about one year and originate along with the leaves from growing points located at the base of the plant. Tillering is influenced mainly by light, nutrient supply, particularly nitrogen, and temperature. Tillering is highest under high light levels, mid temperatures, that's about 13 to 25 degrees C, and adequate moisture and nutrient availability. Once emerged, the daughter tiller is completely reliant on the parent or primary tiller until it develops its own leaf and roots, and this generally takes several weeks. If the primary tiller is stressed during this time, the daughter tiller will be sacrificed and may die. The lifespan of a leaf is equal to the time taken for three leaves to grow per tiller. Thus, each tiller maintains a maximum of about three live leaves as each new leaf emerges after this three leaf stage. The oldest leaf dies. This is the basic principle on which sound pasture management practices are based, that leaves have a limited lifespan and if they are not harvested, or in this case grazed, they will die and be wasted. This relationship is species specific and on the slide you will see the number of leaves for the different species shown. From the process of photosynthesis in sunlight, tillers form glucose and then other water-soluble carbohydrates in their leaves. These water-soluble carbohydrates are used to provide energy for ongoing growth and respiration, which is not immediately used for growth or respiration but is stored, mainly in the lower portion of the tillers and remobilized when the plant needs these resources. There is substantial evidence that the availability of the water-soluble carbohydrates in such plants as ryegrass has a marked effect on the plant's regrowth potential and ability to persist. Recently as it, be, it has been shown to be important from an animal nutritional viewpoint as well, as the water-soluble carbohydrate is the most reliable available form of carbohydrates from pasture in rumen. Regrowth of the ryegrass tiller, water-soluble carbohydrates are particularly important in sustaining plant growth when photosynthesis is unable to provide enough energy to meet the plant's demands. For example, the period after grazing, during cloudy weather or at night. Regrowth of the ryegrass tiller and the accompanying change in water-soluble carbohydrates is shown on the figure on the slide. I'm going to talk you through these stages now and I'd like you to pay particular attention to this as this really does underpin successful pasture management. Regrowth proceeds in the manner because there is a priority for available water soluble carbohydrates. Following grazing, the tiller's first priority is always to re-establish its energy factory by renewing leaves, i.e it needs to continue photosynthesizing. If this is not possible, then ongoing respiration will burn up or use available water-soluble carbohydrates and the tiller will die. Other processes such as root growth and the growth of daughter tillers will also stop or be delayed and water-soluble carbohydrates will be mobilized from the remaining tiller stubble to provide energy for regrowth of the first new leaves. This brings us on to the second stage. As the new leaf starts to expand and grow, it makes its own water-soluble carbohydrates from the photosynthesis. However, all of this new water-soluble carbohydrates is used for growth of the leaf and none is stored. The tiller is still using water-soluble carbohydrate reserves too, and it is not until about the first leaf stage, i.e. one new fully, fully emerged leaf, that the water-soluble carbohydrates begin to be stored. This is the trigger or signal for the roots to begin growing again and at this stage the plant is most vulnerable to regrazing. That is because the water-soluble carbohydrate levels are low, roots are only restarting to grow and the daughter tillers are receiving little or no support from the primary tiller. This then brings us on to stage three. 
At around the two leaf stage of regrowth, water soluble carbohydrate reserves are beginning to build up sufficiently for the plant to again cope and be, a and be, be able to be grazed. Supply of water soluble carbohydrates to daughter tillers begins again and new tillers start to emerge. This may be considered as the minimal grazing interval. As the tiller expands another leaf, three leaf stage, root growth and tillering are now fully active and water soluble carbohydrate levels in the tiller bases have been further replenished and the overall growth is at a maximum. In the final stage or stage four, as the fourth leaf emerges, the oldest leaf, leaf one, begins to die so that the tiller maintains three live leaves. At this stage, pasture quality begins to decline and increasing amounts of pasture are wasted. The three to three and a half leaf stage is considered to be the maximal grazing interval. In addition to the importance of water soluble carbohydrates in regrowth, they also play a role in the survival of plants through periods of stress such as heat, frost and drought. Given all of these factors commonly occur in Australia, it is clear that management can maximise water-soluble carbohydrates by building up and storing, and this will have beneficial effects on plant growth and survival, also known as persistence. Next time you are at the Yang Ying Farm, please take a moment to consider the different perennial grasses we have out there and assess whether they are at one, two, three or four regrowth stages. So let us have an, a look at some aspects of regrowth. Let's start with carbohydrate and protein. The effect of regrowth on pasture quality carbohydrates and proteins is a function of the property of the animals and requires a balance between the soluble protein and the soluble carbohydrates in pasture eaten. At least as much carbohydrates as there is protein, or if not more, is ideal. If there is too, mu too much soluble protein, it is converted into ammonia in the rumen. This excess ammonia needs to be detoxified to urea and excre excreted in the urine. This process requires energy and therefore may have a negative impact on both production and reproduction of a grazing animal. In general, Green growing pasture contains more than enough protein for, the, for a dairy cow requirements, but carbohydrate or energy may be limiting factor. Recent research has shown that the ratio of soluble protein to carbohydrates becomes more balanced after the two leaf, uh, two leaf stage, as water soluble carbohydrate levels increase with the regrowth, while protein levels decline due to leaf maturity. The ratio of crude protein to water soluble carbon can be as high as 5 to 1 at the first leaf stage, changing to 1 to 2 at the third leaf stage. Moving on to digestibility, there is no change in either <coughs> digestibility or metabolized energy of feed on offer with regrowth up to 7, the, st the, leaf, the third leaf stage. However, after the third leaf stage, both digestibility and metabolized energy decline and fiber increases with a buildup of dead leaf and stem material. Minerals. The level of minerals in ryegrass, for example, change remarkably within growth rate. Potassium, which is usually at levels far in excess for the animal's requirements, declines, while calcium and magnesium, important for milk production, increase with regrowth to the fourth leaf stage. One indicator of appropriate minerals, mineral status for the performance of a dairy cow is the ratio of potassium over calcium and magnesium. There is a reasonable evidence that this ratio should be below about 2.2 to reduce the incidence of grass uh, tenny or and other meta metabolic problems. The ratio falls from about 6 at the first leaf stage to below 2.2 at the third leaf stage. Another indicator of appropriate mineral status is the ratio of calcium to phosphorus. The recommended ratio for milking cows is above about 1 to 6, 6 to 1. In ryegrass, this changes from about 1 to 1 at the first leaf stage to over 2 to 1 at the third leaf stage. In order to optimise your crop performance and grazing management, 
you should be aware of three aspects of grazing management. These tend to be species specific, but the general principles or aspects can be demonstrated. I'll use ryegrass as an example. The first thing you need to consider is the interval. This is when to graze. Then the intensity, that's how much you should graze in one go. And finally the duration, how long to graze at any one period. To give a practical example of this, the ideal grazing interval for ryegrass is between two to three leaves per tiller. This allows ryegrass persistence, productivity, utilisation and to maintain quality. These attributes are based partly on the water soluble carbohydrates and how long it takes between each grazing event for these to reach optimal levels. One measurement that could be considered for grazing interval of grass is pasture height or standing dry matter. However, this is not ideal as there are often differences in pasture height in plant genotype. Short rotation of ryegrass, for example, annual and biannual, is larger than the perennial genotypes at a given stage of regrowth. Differences in plant height cultivar are present with variation in growth rates and plant structure even at a comparable growth stage. Differences will occur according to pasture composition and differences in aspects such as soil fertility, particularly nitrogen, water and temperature, can all influence pasture height at a set plant stage growth. The leaf appearance interval is the time it takes for one leaf and the next leaf to appear. In ryegrass, it is determined predominantly by temperature. For example, the first leaf stage in spring takes between five and seven days, while this is longer in other times of the year. This table completes this relationship from autumn, winter and spring. As you can see, it takes a lot longer for a leaf to appear in the winter months than it does in the spring months. Consequences of a shorter grazing interval, that is one less than two leaf stage, can be varied but quite significant. This is because it depletes water soluble carbohydrates reserves. Once these are depleted, there are a number of knock on effects from this. You get reduced dry matter yield in your crop. The number of plants that would survive in the system dramatically falls. The increased invasion of weed species, retardation or death of the root system, reduced tillering with an increased death in tillers, particularly the daughter tillers, an imbalance to the grazing stock in soluble protein to energy levels, and finally an imbalance to the grazing animal in mineral levels such as calcium magnesium which may be too low and potassium which may be too high. As you can see, there are a number of consequences that have significant impacts on a commercial enterprise. So even though the consequences of shorter grazing are quite significant, there may be times when an exception to the rule is worth considering. Advantages of shorter grazing interval at two leaves per tiller can occur when you have rust, which is a fungus, which has affected more than one third of the pasture at the early stage of regrowth, that is in late spring. Or two, during reproductive growth. This is when you have shorter intervals which encourage vegetative tillers and prevent seed set. Or three, sometimes in grazing you see hot, dry years with low soil moisture that cause ryegrass to become semi-dominant. Summer grazing can, uh, can encourage, can overcome this situation and allow increases in leaf appearance interval. That is one stage may be up to 10 to 20 days. In areas where summer active grasses such as pasphalum are, are Pre uh, pre prevalent, pastures may benefit from being grazed at the two leaf stage or earlier to prevent these summer grasses becoming dominant. dominant. The shorter grazing intervals will do less harm in the ryegrass during this period 
They're letting summer grasses dominate the pasture as ryegrass plants have shut down and are not as active. So what if you were to leave the grazing interval to be longer? Let's stay, say, leaf stage three or more. There are a number of consequences which include an increase in the number of dead leaves and this represents feed waste in your operation. An increase in the ryegrass tiller shading, an increase in the prevalence of rust, an increase in the prevalence uh, in stem elongation, a decrease in nutri nutritive value of feed, so that's things like fibre, digestibility and metabolite en energy, and finally a lower utilisation of the, for the grazing animal. The grazing density will be a consequence of your pasture density and your composition of your paddock. So therefore it is quite a site specific characteristic. It tends to be based on the stubble height that is remaining. For example, the ideal height for ryegrass is between 4 to 6 centimetres of stubble. The residue will vary across Australia and it tends to range from about 900 for open pasture to about 16,000 kilograms of dry matter per hectare for more dense pastures. So what are the consequences if the grazing intensity is too great? Let us say that you graze down to below a plant height of less 4 or less than 4 centimetres. You tend to see a decrease in the animal productivity. You also see decreased water-soluble carbohydrates, decreased dry matter production in your crop and an a decreased survival, particularly tiller death. You may also um, see increased soil surface temperature which will lead to plant death in your crop. So what happens if you don't craze enough? Well, if you leave your stubble to 6 centimetres or more in the example of ryegrass, you will have a number of consequences. The first is faster regrowth which initially sounds good. However, if your grazing is in a normal paddock rotation, this will mean that you will have waste left in the system, as you will have leaves that would be good for growing, will have died back before the animals have time to get back to your paddock. The remaining leaves have a, are older and therefore they have a lower photosynthetic efficiency than younger leaves, and as a rule of thumb, they tend to be lower in nutrient value. This will have um, nutrient impacts on your crop, on your uh, livestock as well. A good, a good indicator for good feed in your paddocks is the post-grazing residues. If, for example, you have five or six centimetres of predominantly uneven remainder of residue, this indicates that the cows are too well fed and have started to waste pasture. While if you're um, post-grazing residues are four centimetres or less, it typically indicates that this, the cows are still hungry. Let us now talk about grazing duration. In general, animals should not be allowed to graze in any one area for more than two to three days as the absolute maximum. Animals regraze the new leaves and shoots which have grown from the water-soluble carbohydrate reserves and this severely reduces subsequent regrowth and jeopardises survival of the tillers and the long-term viability of your paddock. If cows are grazed in larger paddocks for more than two days, a back fence should be used to prevent them regrazing the area. So let us talk now a little bit about grazing management systems and set, step, set stocking. We're going to talk about a model that involves four paddock rotation grazing. We're also going to talk about intensive rotational grazing or cell grazing. There are many variations of these themes and the ideal system for your farm will be flexible and may include some components from all three. Most pastures are enclosed by fences where perennial foragers are grown. On pasture systems, animals spend up to three quarters of the day feeding. On well-managed pastures, animals should be able to obtain all their nutritional needs. Set stocking is a type of grazing management system. It is also referred to as continuous grazing in some countries. 
Animals have access to a large pasture and they move freely around in the grazing area. This area is defined by the paddock fencing. This is a low management input system compared to rotational grazing. Continuously grazing pasture under, typically undergo seasonal cycles of overgrazing and undergrazing and this will depend on the weather conditions and soil fertility. It may suit subclover and there is very low labour requirements. The image on the screen is results from the Broadford grazing experiment conducted by DPI between the years of 1994 and 2003. The image shows a comparison of two of the treatments. One was an intensive rotation plot and the second was a set stocked plot. As you can see, there is a lot more soil and much less green pasture present in the set stocked plot than in the intensive rotation plot. Intensive rotational grazing can be managed in several different ways. You may do this kind of rotation for certain reasons which include it improves the perenniality of the grasslands, it can lower nutrient transfer, it can increase dry matter production. For example, if conducted in winter, you can make improvements of up to 25% and in spring up to 50%. It can, however, increase the drying of the soil profile. Supplements are additional food elements that you add when you're not using your pasture. Examples of these include silage, hay, grain and feed mixes. They have multiple purposes or roles. They can enable you to achieve pasture management goals, specifically when you have food shortages. This may be due to adverse periods or climate conditions or it may be on the, kit, the, the, the change of the season, for example, winter going into autumn. You may need to do this to minimise your grazing. Or you can use food um, supplements as security to increase stocking rates with confidence. These are during periods of surplus. You can also use supplements in managing pastures to compensate for gaps in feed quality. An example of the application is that you can slow down your grazing rotation towards the winter by using supplements. You may use supplements in your pasture management to increase production of your animal. For example, in the dairy industry, you may decide that you want to increase your productivity from your cows, irrespective of your pasture conditioned and or availability at that time. In theory, one kilogram of good quality barley grain should enable the production of 2.5 litres of milk. However, the actual response demonstrated by research falls far short of that, typically 1.5 litres of milk. The highest response to supplements is about 1.7 litres of extra milk per day for every one kilogram of, con of concentrate feed even when the longer term effects of such an increase in body size and improved conditions were taken into account. This demonstrates that the ratio is not as good as when the cows are feeding off the pasture directly. It is important if you are going to use supplements on a routine basis that you need to examine the economics very carefully. This is a classic example of where we are farming for a commodity and not for a direct production output. Therefore, it is the profitability, but not the productivity that is important in this scenario. So that brings us to the end of the lecture on pasture management. So let me summarize what I hope you have learned. Firstly, that you are managing an ecosystem. That is, you are managing crop and animals or livestock together. And when you're managing crops, you have to measure the, manage the soil ecosystem, the climate e ecosystem, particularly that of the effects of rainfall, and farming management inputs. This is one area of farming where it is continuously a compromise or a balance, and that this has to be optimised for your farm, for your livestock, and for your inputs. 
this balance is typically between crop production versus stock production, and so you need to examine the economics carefully, as optimising one may not always optimise the second. In order to completely successfully manage pastures, you need knowledge in pasture cultivars, crop growth assessment, and how you use that crop growth assessment to ascertain components such as grazing intervals, grazing densities, and grazing intensities. Finally, we've looked at specific management practices that are commonly practiced in Australia, such as set stocking, rotational, and intensive rotational stocking. All of these you should be familiar with the basic concepts. This is the end of the lecture.